Whenever you're studying a text, it's always best practice to make sure that you are thinking about it in all the different ways that it can be interpreted. Part of that is having an understanding of how different quotes and events and characters from your text can be understood differently by different people and that you're not just relying on your first impression from the first time that you read through it. So in light of that, today's video is about six key quotes from We Have Always Lived in the Castle. It is not the best six quotes or anything like that. It's just six things that I noticed the first or second time that I read through this text that I thought might be able to help you guys understand it just that little bit better. We're going to dive in with this first one here that you can see on the screen. What place would be better for us than this? Who wants us outside? The world is full of terrible people. And the reason I've chosen this one is because there's so many different little elements to it. The world is full of uh, terrible people. Who wants us outside? And really what Shirley Jackson achieves here through this quote uh, through Mary Catherine is this uh, dichotomy that exists. You know, we have the outside world and then we have the Blackwoods. And we have this very clear distinction between the two of them and the way in which they feel about themselves being defined as, you know, the hatred that they receive from that outside world. That is then obviously returned with, you know, this idea of the world is full of terrible people. There's a fear, there's a mistrust that exists within Mary Catherine. Of course, there's a great irony in this when we uh, go on to discover, you know, the actions of Mary Catherine that have uh, begun this entire novel and, and started all of these things with her, you know, doing away with her family. So it's a fantastic quote that every time we look at it, we can find something else to it. I'm sure there's probably something else that you've seen in this quote that you're thinking, oh, yeah, I, I see it a little bit differently as well and of course that's to be encouraged that's where the really good stuff is when we also take a look at this we start to look at this idea of conformity something that I'll talk about with some of the other quotes as well and this idea of people who choose not to conform to you know a dominant society and the way in which people are asked to conform to that society the world is full of terrible people next we have Perhaps they came in darkness, not to be recognised, as if each of them wanted to hide from the others, and bringing us food was somehow a shameful thing to do in public. And of course, this uh, quote appears after the fire and after the events of the fire, and the girls have hidden for, for quite some time at the house, uh, and the people have come up trying to coax them uh, you know, to come out and so on, and the people start bringing food, which of course is something that we should really dive into because it seems like a minor detail, but it's that nice little twist to this idea. If, like with the previous quote, the world is full of terrible people, if we just have this blunt understanding that everybody outside in the village are all just terrible people, well, then we're not really thinking you know in a sharp manner about what this text is really all about what is i think key to this quote is this idea that of course compassion exists within these people from the village there are good people out there it is not a complete case of everyone from the village being terrible and hateful and spiteful however they come under the cover of darkness, which is a very, very important part of this quote. This idea that those who are going to show compassion, those who are going to show a sense of empathy, a sense of care towards these girls, have to do so under that cover of darkness. They don't want to be seen to be doing this by the other people. When we think about that, we think about, well, why is it that they can't, conf uh, why is it that they can't show this compassion? Why is it that they are challenged to feel that they must only do this under the cover of darkness, like it's some sort of dirty secret? A really great one to jump into and start thinking about so that we don't just have a very black and white way of viewing this text in that there are bad people outside and that's it and that's the only way we can think about it. Anytime we read a quote like this, we should be thinking, well, what is Jackson saying to us through this quote about the nature of people? And if we sharpen our focus there, what we start to think about is what her values, her big ideas, her messages might be about society at large. Because anytime she mentions the people of the village, you know, we can really take that as a comment about how a society functions and how people fall into these types of things. With that in mind, these next two quotes, I've put them together because they are pretty similar in, in what they mean to me, are really great comments about what Jackson might be saying about how a society organises itself and how people act and behave when they are forced to live amongst each other and coexist in a community. It was as though the people needed the ugliness of the village and fed on it. 
the houses and the stores seem to have been set up in contemptuous haste to provide shelter for the drab and the unpleasant. Whatever planned to be colourful lost its heart quickly in the village. And so what we have here is a comment about those who choose to conform, those who choose to be a part of the society, those who choose to live together and live like other people do. When we think about what Jackson might be saying here, we can consider this idea of the haste to provide shelter speaks to a fear uh, that these people might have. Of course, we do have another quote where Mary Catherine speaks about, you know, the villagers have you know so much to be afraid of or whatever it might be. We can take our thinking that little bit further in that, what Jackson might be saying when people live in a very similar way to each other, when people organise their lives, when people choose to live in a similar way to each other, and what that might say about them. Drab, you know, uh, colourless, you know, everything that was colourful lost its heart quickly in the village. It's a pretty pessimistic idea that Jackson might be getting at here, but one that can perhaps help sharpen our focus when it comes to what she really might be trying to say through this text. I've put these next two quotes together because they are the culmination of Mary Catherine speaking about living on the moon. And if you're anything like me, the first time you read through this text, you were probably a little bit puzzled when the narrator was mentioning, you know, living on the moon and this is what I do on the moon and talking with a cat and all those types of things. So we can start to think about what that might symbolize. Now, you don't want to be walking away with an, what I call like an equal sign. Like, okay, anytime I read about the moon, it equals this idea. But you can, you know, build up a range of ideas as to what Shirley Jackson might have been getting to with Mary Catherine's constant, uh, you know, uh, references to living on the moon and all those things that it might mean. If we see these two quotes here, I was pretending that I did not speak their language. On the moon, we spoke a soft, liquid tongue and sang in the starlight, looking down on the dead, dried world. And we held each other in the dark hall and laughed, with tears running down our cheeks and echoes of our laughter going up the ruined stairway to the sky. I am so happy, Constance said at last, gasping. Mary Cat, I am so happy. I told you that you would like it on the moon. And so what we have here is this complete rejection of society uh, by the two Blackwood girls. And what is most, uh, I think, pertinent about this quote is that all of this discussion of the moon that we've been hearing throughout the novel, this is obviously getting towards the ending. And we have uh, Mary Cat saying to Constance, I told you that you would like it on the moon. When we consider what she might be really saying there is this idea of, I told you that you would like it when you finally, you know, completely rejected what society wanted from you, when you completely rejected all of the advances of those people that you thought were trying to help you and live, you know, have you live in their way. However you view the relationship between the two girls uh, and the manipulation that happens, particularly from Mary Cat to Constance, what we have here is the culmination of this idea and the complete rejection of a society. And so the reason why I've included this is so that you're thinking as you're reading through the novel with subsequent readings, thinking to yourself every time you hear about the moon, this very clear idea of it being something so far removed from the ordinary, so far removed from the day-to-day -day world that so many people in the village come to understand. This next quote's a short one, but I think a really fantastic one to be using when we're going to talk about the prevailing attitude of the society of the time and the prevailing attitude of the people outside of the Blackwood house. And it comes about uh, when it is said, we want you and Mary Catherine to come to our house until we can decide what to do with you. And so this prevailing attitude of people is that they have the power to, okay, we'll take care of you. But as part of, part of taking care of them is taking authority over them, decide what will be done to them. So there's that lack of freedom, of course, uh, that uh, Mary Catherine rallies against so vehemently. When we take a look at this quote and we start to think about what it is that Jackson might be saying about how people conform, which we've mentioned a couple of times in this video, and how a society exists as this very strong sort of a current that everybody gets caught up in, to the point where it seemed like a natural thing to be said to these girls, we want you to come uh, to come to our house until we can decide what to do with you. Even though you might not 100% agree with what uh, Mary Cat and Constance do by the end of this text, 
we do need to make sure that we're taking a look at the comments that are being made here about what they are resisting and what they are rejecting and why it is seen as so absurd and so uh, you know ridiculous that they would look to uh, you know not live in the way that other people do. And when we take a look at quotes like this, we start to see the power of a society and what it's doing in the way in which it's encouraging people to conform and all act in the same manner. Finishing off with a short quote uh, about Constance, because I think when you read this novel, you know, for the second, third, fourth time, what you'll start to see is that, you know, the way I describe it is that uh, Mary Catherine is chipping away at Constance and trying to bring her over into thinking in the same way as her. And the moment for me when I realised that, that she had been successful in doing that and that Constance had truly changed as a character and had completely rejected those that she was so afraid of outside of her house, was when she made the joke to Mary Catherine, I wonder if I could eat a child if I had the chance. That was the, uh, the joke made by, um, by Mary Catherine, to which Constance replies, I doubt if I could cook one. And so it's that joining in on that humour, that dark humour, that, you know, very, uh, you know, sarcastic and cynical way of, you know, speaking about other people and, you know, quite literally cooking children, uh, is this idea of her joining in on the absurd. Throughout the novel, you'll notice that a lot of the times when Mary Catherine says things that are a little bit eccentric or a little bit odd or, you know, strange... Uh, Constance is the one who very patiently says, oh, Mary Cat and all these types of things. Always very patient with her, but seeing her as being a little odd, a little different, all these types of things. This is the moment for me where Constance changes and Constance moves towards actually acting and making similar jokes and similar absurd claims to what her sister does. And therefore, we see that it's come full circle and that she's ready there to join her on the moon, as we mentioned before in those quotes. Thank you very much for watching, guys. That is just six quotes. There's probably another 600 that are worthy of deeper analysis. If you think that there was a really standout quote that I should have included in this video, please, by all means, put it down there in the comments. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask about, we have always lived in this in the castle, please make sure you put those in the comments as well. Check out the rest of the channel uh, for help with your VCE English uh, studies. And until I see you next time, all the best for your sacks and your exams and good luck.